Hi, I'm Brad Power, and this is the Cancer Patient Lab. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Eileen O'Reilly with us. Uh, she's with Memorial Sloan Kettering and a leader in research and clinical care in a, in a variety of pancreatic cancer and others that are, I guess, associated uh, systems. Uh, uh, just, just to cover a couple of uh, housekeeping items, which we always uh, do up front. One is this is not medical advice. This is for information purposes only for you to take to your medical team. And second, uh, I call it the Miranda rights. Everything you say can and will be used against you. Uh, that is, uh, th everything we're saying today will be made public. So if you're concerned about your image being made public or what you say being made public, turn off your camera, change your name, and don't say anything. Um, and then finally, uh, the Cancer Patient Lab is a patient-led volunteer community, and we would welcome uh, any donations you might be inspired to make through our website. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. O'Reilly. She has a, a, a bio and a set of titles and history that is uh, about a dozen long. I think if I, if I read it, it might take several minutes. Um, but she is um, uh, an expert in uh, pancreatic and other cancers, as we mentioned. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's an Irish connection uh, uh, back in her uh, origins and, and treating. I went through Dublin briefly uh, just about six months ago uh, and got to see, see Dublin, thankfully. Um, but anyway, she, that, that's uh, where she's from originally. Uh, Dr. O'Reilly, the screen share should work if you have slides and, and please take it away. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation uh, to be here. And uh, wonderful to to meet you all. I do know, I think, and recognize uh, some names and, and people. So uh, hopefully, we'll have a good discussion. Uh, what I've been tasked to do or asked to do is give a fifteen minute or so uh, presentation, which I'll do, and it's really just to set the scene uh, for questions. And we'll be delighted. Uh, to take uh, any questions afterwards. And also just give me one moment here and we'll get this going. All right. So title is Pancreas Cancer and 2024. And really this is just kind of a high level view. So snapshots of where we are and what's happening. And as I think many of you uh, have alluded to on the call, it's exciting times in pancreas cancer, you know, having been in this field for a while and seen a lot of things sadly not materialize. I think they're really, uh, the field is sort of poised for, for change. And I'll show you some of the things that we're hoping are going to contribute to that. I do need to acknowledge that I do a lot of research, a lot of uh, consulting data and safety monitoring boards, steering committees, and have various disclosures. Most of it is uncompensated. I'm going to talk about a lot of investigational uh, use, so just there for your reference. So these are the topics, just very brief recap of the highlights in pancreas cancer, an overview of the current standards, one slide, and then where the field is moving, which I think will be most of our uh, focus today. So this disease is a, a disease that's getting more common and many are aware that this is sort of projected uh, to become one of the leading uh, diagnoses uh, in coming decades and not clearly understood why. Uh, the, you know, our population is aging, that's part of it, but there are some fundamental other changes that are happening with this disease. And pretty steadily now for the last 25 years, it's about a half to 1% increase per annum. And that's significantly different from most other, other solid organ cancers where diseases have plateaued and incidence is starting to, to fall. And this is, you know, just underscores that it's uh, it's a big public health uh, challenge and it's a, a global uh, challenge as, as this disease um, results in about a half a million diagnoses uh, worldwide. So a lot of information on, on the slide, but I'll just pare it down. Uh, traditionally and, and fair to say, currently, the main standards of treatment for almost all stages are chemotherapy based, and that is... Uh, 
been uh, improved and refined, but imperfect. And multi-agent uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy are in all our guidelines for advanced disease, for post-operative preventative therapy, and for treatment of localized disease. But increasingly, you know, the focus is shifting to these sort of subgroups. And as the audience, I think, well knows that uh, KRAS is essentially ubiquitous in pancreas cancer, a critical driver uh, gene involved in growth and pathogenesis and metastasis from this disease. And uh, we've known about this forever, but not been successfully able to target uh, this and, and now therapeutics that we'll, we'll touch on. But equally important is when we don't see a KRAS mutation, which is a relatively small subset of pancreas cancer, but there are other findings uh, in the tumor uh, genomically based for which there are a series of uh, therapeutics that are in the clinic. We look hard to find those. And then a well-defined subgroup is uh, individuals who have homologous repair deficiency or have ineffective DNA repair courtesy of a BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, and some other gene alterations. And there we have chemotherapeutics, which have heightened advantages, PARP inhibitors, and uh, an emerging role for immunotherapy-based combinations. So could you just quickly lead into this? And I, I realize, again, we have a very sophisticated audience here, uh, but just to level set, uh, we're talking about germline and somatic, germline being inherited predisposition, somatic being, uh, for the purposes of our discussion, restricted to the tumor and being a target uh, that represents a unique opportunity in terms of a more favorable uh, treatment uh, index and safety profile. In pancreas cancer, and, and this is not unique to pancreas cancer, uh, but we see uh, about 10 or 11% or 12% of people with genetic predisposition. And those genes are important from the potential of possible actionability or treatments, but they're also important for screening implications and maybe opportunities for early detection. And that's always a good topic to discuss. I don't have any slides on that today, but perhaps we'll come back to that in the discussion. And for the audience, you know, the way we do genetic testing has really evolved to be practical, feasible, and timely uh, in that we do what's called point of care testing. So at the time of diagnosis uh, and essentially at the first meeting for uh, most of the uh, new people that we'll, we'll encounter, we'll recommend getting germline and somatic testing underway using a variety of educational tools. And then on the back end, if there's a positive result on the germline finding, just because of the criticality of that information to the person and their family, we'll have that uh, sequenced to our genetics team. But for the most part, the rest is handled uh, by the oncology team. And, and that's really made this practical, scalable, and feasible, not to take away in any way from genetic expertise, but just making sure we get this information in a timely way to act on us uh, in this disease where timelines can be more challenged than in other malignancies. And the importance of this is that there are profound examples, and, and this is one, of a subset uh, of people who have alterations in DNA damage repair where uh, they um, have particularly benefit from platinum-based treatments and from this class of drugs, an oral targeted group of medications called PARP inhibitors where we can see these striking uh, durable responses. And just for you know, privacy here, I've not put any dates or anything, but this is measured in many years. And it's we want that to be true for you know, most people with this disease, and we're certainly not there yet. But the key point is we have to look, and if we find, we have to act on, on that information. And that's you know, easier said than done because of all of the complexities of this disease. But always, you know, what we're hoping for is that we'll find this unique target and be able to capitalize on that in terms of favorable outcome. 
That's been underpinned by this uh, large study, which looked at uh, a, this class of drugs called uh, PARP inhibitors and uh, ultimately led to FDA approval. Uh, magnitude of benefit is real in pancreas cancer, although not as uh, pronounced as it is in other diseases. And uh, there's a lot of work underway to see how we can uh, scale that. And for example, bringing PARP inhibitors to earlier stage disease setting, they were evaluated in metastatic disease, but looking at them in the postoperative setting, uh, looking in combination with immunotherapy, uh, individuals who have BRCA mutations have heightened levels of genomic instability and maybe more targets for the immune system and roles in that regard. And then we have this uh, uh, other study, which is looking at a different platinum and also looking at high-dose uh, therapy, in particular alkylating therapy, using uh, autologous transplantation in the BRCA setting to see if there might be a role. This is a study that will read out uh, this autumn and looking at immunotherapy and PARP inhibitors in selected groups of people with pancreas cancer. And again, we think this is a theme that's going to be one uh, to build on. So specifics to come a little bit later in the autumn. So just in view of time, I'm going to pick up a couple of themes here uh, in terms of emerging areas, going to tumor-based genetics. In about 15%, maybe 20% of people with pancreas cancer will see uh, deletion of a gene called MTAP. It, it is uh, associated with other genes in, in pancreas cancer. And the importance is that there may be, again, treatment implication. Uh, this is an example uh, that was uh, presented at a major meeting last year. And this is in an indiv individual who had uh, prior treatments, prior chemotherapy. And when we see responses to targeted therapy in the setting of previous chemotherapy uh, treatments, it, it always tells us that we're probably onto something in in this disease, and that uh, is being developed in combination with a variety of different agents. So, moving to KRAS-directed uh, treatment, and you know, this is, is is where the focus. And I know that you've had a discussion from one of our colleagues in the field relatively recently, but. Just to illustrate, right, the importance of KRAS, it really can't be uh, overstated in pancreas cancer. It's, um, again, present in the vast majority of people. And we think even, you know, 95, 96% of people will see, if not KRAS itself, other alterations in that pathway that lead to all the downstream consequences that are part of the disease process that we know. And this is part of the excitement uh, is that there are many therapeutics in the pit, in the in the clinic looking at targeting ras directly targeting it indirectly targeting the downstream protein uh, starting to use combinations and uh, some of these have shown a um, an impact so KRAS G12C occurs in a small percentage of people with pancreas cancer, 1%. And reminder, this is not an inherited, it's a somatic alteration. And here, uh, proof of principle has been identified with multiple different agents. This plot on the bottom just showing uh, the uh, durability of uh, the outcome for uh, subsets of people over time. So this is, this is exciting, but this is even more exciting uh, it, just because it uh, impacts uh, a larger proportion of people with this disease. So this, this drug is a PANRAS or ALRAS inhibitor, and it's being looked at in pancreas, lung, colorectal, and other diseases with uh, KRAS. And this is uh, data that was uh, publicly shared uh, earlier in the week or last week that speaks to uh, the ability to shrink the cancer in the setting of previously treated uh, pancreas cancer. And uh, what's happening is that this is moving to a phase three trial in previously treated uh, pancreas cancer in uh, people who've had one different, uh, one line of, of prior treatment and compared to chemotherapy. And this is 
Essentially, while it's a targeted agent, it's actually relatively unselected in terms of the patient population that it will include because it covers all the major uh, versions of KRAS that we see in pancreas cancer. And just to show that very interesting signal uh, with this disease. So a lot happening and sort of alluding to this next steps are integrating RAS inhibitors with chemotherapy in some malignancies, including in pancreas cancer, uh, interest in exploring with immunotherapy, combining with targeted therapies and, and targeting narrow RAS-focused drugs with pan-RAS drugs and bringing it into earlier stage disease where the impacts may be ultimately even more profound. So all of this will have to be sorted out in the clinic in the next you know, uh, two to five years. Uh, but there's a lot of questions here uh, that are poised to be answered and uh, a lot of momentum to see this moving forward. Just in the, in the last few minutes to, um, again, set the scene for our discussion, just wanted to highlight another very uh, interesting and exciting area is immunotherapy and vaccines in pancreas cancer. And vaccines have obviously had a long history in cancer in general and in pancreas cancer. And it's only recently with a few different approaches that we started to see a signal this particular vaccine is, is looking at a sort of a platform delivery system uh, that uh, uh, targets protein uh, activated in lymph nodes presented to the immune system and results in immune activation. And here the, uh, the peptide or the target is, is KRAS and with the goals, early goals in pancreas cancer to see, could you generate an immune response? Can that be done safely? And is that immune response associated with outcome? And the early signal with this KRAS off the shelf, non-customized scalable vaccine is that that was feasible and doable and early signals su suggesting that those who had an immune immune response relative to those that did not, uh, that there may be um, a difference in their oncologic uh, outcome. And this uh, is led to this uh, study, which is underway in pancreas cancer in the resected setting. So people have completed all their treatments, sort of agnostic to what an individual has had, as long as they're free over, of overt disease, randomized to vaccine versus observation. And in this setting, observation would be the standard to see, uh, does this uh, early signal translate into uh, anti-cancer immunity and in terms of delayed recurrence? So this is actively recruiting and uh, we're looking forward to see the readout of this. A couple of other things, just other drugs just to think about or pathways or uh, classes of drugs that are showing some potential in pancreas cancer is a class of drugs called CD40. It's a, an immune agonist that activates the immune system, has been combined with chemotherapy and showing nice uh, anti-cancer uh, shrinkage here in a mid-phase study. And this is going to, to move to uh, phase three in, in a coming uh, period of time. And I think the audience is well aware that pancreas cancer is characterized by an intrinsic degree of immune suppression. Lots of reasons uh, for that, the whole sort of complex microenvironment, lack of oxygen, uh, immune cells may be excluded. There's lots of immune suppressive substances in the milieu of the malignant cells, one of them being uh, CD73, and this has been correlated with an adverse outcome. And one treatment strategy is, what about uh, trying to remove that immune barrier? Can you uh, impact outcome in pancreas cancer by using an anti-CD73 uh, small molecule inhibitor that's given intravenously with chemotherapy and an early signal in an early phase study suggests that there once more is something that uh, has potential. And this is uh, also moving to uh, phase three uh, as we speak. And um, a lot of, I think, potential for this class of drugs, a well-tolerated class of agents. Also want to highlight just some work from one of my colleagues uh, here, Vinod Balachandran and his and our group, who uh, he made a sort of a seminal observation, uh, also uh, observed by by others that 
a subset of people with pancreas cancer who fare well have an enrichment of certain T cells in their immune system and an expansion of that. And the whole idea, if we could vaccinate and expand this uh, pool of T cells, might this uh, lead to an improvement in outcome? And indeed, that uh, was done with an early phase study where once more the goal was to show that this was safe and feasible, and this was using a personalized neoantigen appro vaccine approach. So using an mRNA platform technique, individual customization, so not, not an off-the-shelf uh, vaccine. And you know, so it's a lot of um, logistics to make this happen in the background. This was conducted during the early part of the pandemic, and this was you know, feasible, safe, and again, showed an oncologic uh, signal with high immunity in about half of patients that was not explained just by being innately more immune responsive, but suggestion that it was in fact the vaccine that was contributing and this once more is being evaluated in an ongoing uh, randomized uh, study for people with resected pancreas cancer. And I think here, just the, the message being that two different approaches, and this is not doing justice to all the work and strategies that are being developed in the field, but they've independently shown the same thing, that if you generate a potent and specific immune response, that may be translatable into uh, an anti-cancer uh, benefit. So both of these are moving forward, and I think it adds increased um, credence to, to, to both that uh, several different approaches have shown this. And there again, there are many, many others. So I think in view of time, perhaps I'll stop here in terms of any formal presentation. Uh, I do have a few additional slides to show, but we can come back to these in the discussion and maybe we'll uh, stop sharing and uh, delighted to, uh, to start the open uh, part of the forum here. Thank you. That was a rapid fire <laughs> run yes. through a lot of options. Um, so I imagine there are going to be a lot of follow up questions. Uh, we'd like to use the raise hand feature. Uh, so, for, and then I'll call on the people who have questions for Dr. O'Reilly. Um, there were a number of, uh, just while we're doing that, uh, there were a number of questions in the chat, um, which um, really get it around. And I think. And it's not just because we have friends from Boston Gene here, but it gets around the diagnostics, um, whether that's um, <clears throat> pre or post or, you know, at diagnosis or immediately after. What's been going on that you see in the diagnostics field? Obviously, uh, there are a lot of um, opportunities. Now, if you have this mutation, then we have something for you. If you have BRCA, if you have KRAS, et cetera. So how do you see that evolving, Dr. Riley? Right. Yeah, th thank you very much. I think this is a, you know, a very key message for people that this is something we want to do as soon as a person is diagnosed, ideally. And, you know, our guidelines sort of have a, a little catching up to do right now. It's sort of standard of care looking at the germline. So looking for any inherited predisposition with a panel of genes and doing either tumor based or liquid uh, biopsies at presentation. It's important, though, to acknowledge that there are some unique challenges to pancreas cancer, that it can be hard to get tissue. And the, you know, from the technical perspective, and we sometimes need a, a first pass, we need a second pass, we need a third attempt. And partly it's because of this sort of stromal this microenvironment that we talked about, whether not just the malignant cells, but there's fibrosis, there's scarring, there's immune cells and other stuff that we biopsy and sometimes we don't get an answer. I think it's also important to note that for liquid biopsies, we're dependent on tumor shedding, so detectable uh, DNA and, and other things in the bloodstream, and pancreas cancer, more so than other diseases, can shed less. So the level in the blood and the ability to profile that uh, can be hard. And it's you know not uncommon that we'll we think we have a good biopsy. And then three weeks later, when we do quality control, DNA extraction, et cetera, that we don't have a, a usable source. So these these are some of, again, the challenges of, of, of pancreas cancer. But I think 
getting this information early, getting the highest quality and the largest amount of tissue and profiling comprehensively, both germline and somatic, ideally as an in integrated approach, I think gives the, you know, the, the best information. And to say, and I think again, many on the call will speak to this, this is a rapidly evolving area, right? And our um, ability to detect targets uh, is changing even just from a couple of years ago. So uh, just so two, two follow-up points and then I'll go to the, the raised hands. So the liquid biopsy then would presumably apply to MRD. So monitoring the disease uh, progression would be difficult because of the lack of enough circulating uh, tumor DNA in the blood. Mm. It, that, it can be I, used in, in that context. I think that that's still an early use in pancreas cancer where I think its greatest use right now is being able to understand KRAS mutational status, right? Whether a person has a KRAS mutation or not. And that's a more proximate answer for the most part relative to tumor-based uh, sequencing in that the timelines are, are quicker. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but increasingly in pancreas cancer, we'll want and need this information at the time of starting treatment. Right now, you know, for the most part, uh, we don't necessarily have that, uh, even with, you know, all the setup uh, that one might think could make that feasible to have it in real time for, for most people with this disease, meaning it takes weeks to sometimes even a month or two. And then the other side of the equation, uh, a, a blood test that would uh, identify much earlier, because of course, typically when pancreatic cancer is diagnosed, it's very advanced. And so Roger Royce, who's here. Roger, would you be willing to share your experience with, uh, was it Garden that you got or or gra a Grail or what, what was the test? It was gallery. <clears throat> gallery test. Uh, I knew they, it was the G word. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, gallery yeah, by Braille. They they picked it up early, stage two B, borderline resectable, um, and then uh, you know six months of chemo and surgery, and that was two years ago. And I currently uh, monitor with the Signatera uh, CT DNA, and uh, also uh, circulating tumor cell tests in my blood. So I keep a strong eye on it because the doctors tell me it is extremely likely to to recur, but it hasn't yet. Good to hear. And I, I, I think this this whole theme of blood-based biomarkers and early detection, you know, is is a highly relevant one and highly interesting one to, to pancreas cancer. And obviously going beyond DNA, methylation signatures, protein signatures in the blood. And uh, some of these have shown some, you know, early potential. I, I, I think we're going to need a level of even sort of deeper sensitivity. Uh, for, for pancreas cancer relative to other diseases, and it's likely to be their utilization in in maybe an enriched uh, group of people rather than the kind of wider population at large that they may have greatest potential. So, mm -hmm. for example, if we know that, you know, a family has a germline mutation that predisposes to this disease, uh, that's a group where, where perhaps uh, some of these blood-based biomarkers along with uh, monitoring and other tools may be important. Or an, uh, another group that's you know, not as well known, but in the pancreas cancer world, we have our eyes all over this, is people who develop diabetes, you know, over the age of 50 without, you know, personal, um, you know, body habitus or lifestyle or family history that might suggest that they might be at risk of this disease. That to uh, to an oncologist is a and a pancreas cancer oncologist is is a red flag. There's a, you know, a, a real percentage of people that will go on to to have pancreas cancer, and this may be a, you know, a, a biomarker, as it were, that's approximate one by a number of, of years that could lead to the utilization of some of these um, screening approaches. Uh, and there, there's a big national study and, and many uh, smaller efforts sort of focused on this space in, in pancreas cancer. Coincidentally, I was at a, an ASCO conference this past weekend and randomly sat next to a doctor who was mentioning that diabetes connection and that that would be a an audience where you might want to do more screening or early or early testing 
Uh, Roger, did you, did you have anything else you want to say? I know you've also had the, uh, you, you've also had apheresis and, you know, enhancing s some of your um, immune system cells. Yeah, I, I, I noticed that. I, I didn't realize that was something that was even accepted in the U.S., the idea of expansion. Uh, and I did NK and T cell expansion, and I also did a couple different neoantigen peptide vaccines. And for Alan Morris, it was nine peptides, or nine amino acids. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I don't know what worked, it seems to. I, I do wanna make one comment and then I'll let other people ask their questions. What you're talking about biomarkers, um, before this happened, um, cause I, you know, I, I was getting tested and, and a few things just should have tipped me off. One, my blood sugar went up for no reason while my weight went down. Secondly, my CRP went way up and uh, nobody, I thought, oh, it must be cardiovascular, but it wasn't at all. Um, what was the other thing? There were some other things that were just a little off that you wouldn't associate. Oh, I had I had some itching, you know, just stuff you wouldn't think that would be <laughs> pancreas. And it was just a bunch of little things. And I will tell you, my primary care physician did not associate that with pancreatic cancer at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I know now, looking back on it, that those were pretty significant clues. Yeah, I, I think, you, you, you know, the, this is an important uh, message and it's a, an educational one uh, for the field at large that a change in HbA1c, you know, worsening of pre-existing diabetes, new onset diabetes without those traditional characteristics, uh, there's probably something amiss with the pancreas. And one may not know it for a few years, but that's part of the reason your story, um, you know, highlights why there's this now renewed focus on understanding what that means for a given person and whether that can be capitalized on in terms of screen screening and you know not to minimize the challenges of screening right it's this disease while it's increasing in incidence it's still a very low frequency event in the wider population and it's always the the challenge of you know how sensitive can your test be and how many people do you have to screen to uh, to avail of a of an advantage that makes it on a population basis a worthwhile thing? And we think, and the current you know guidelines do don't suggest that screening for people without any enhanced risk is going to be a value with the current tools we have today. Uh, but that that we hope will change as we get again um, greater ability to detect you know subtleties that predate uh, the emergence of this disease not just by weeks or months uh, but by a, a much uh, longer period of time and that's I'm sure when we'll you know make a, a major inroad into this uh, diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jill Rosen. You have your hand up. Oh, yes. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for letting me ask a couple of questions. Um, Dr. O'Reilly, I just, I, I loved your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you had mentioned that the RMC uh, 6236 might be moving to phase three soon. Um, do you have an idea of when, or is, is this something you should still be looking at phase one applications if you're a patient hoping to get into a trial at this point? Yeah, so there's you know a lot of RAS therapeutics in the clinic. Uh, RMC six two three six is the furthest along in pancreas cancer, in in terms of where it is, and it's you no know, very imminently uh, going to phase three. It's in a very specific setting, so it's uh, for people with pancreas cancer who have metastatic disease, whose disease has uh, grown uh, despite one uh, initial line of treatment. So it's in a yep. second line specific setting, and again, yep. comparing drug to chemotherapy. However, in parallel with all of that, there are multiple ongoing uh, phase one, phase one B combinations that are just starting. They're going to be scaling up over the next, you know, three to six months and maybe even uh, sooner, which okay. uh, we hope will mean a lot more opportunity for a lot more people uh, to access uh, this class of drugs. And not just this drug, but, you know, related, uh, related therapeutics, uh, and some of them are PANRAS as well, and some of them are more uh, what we call mutant or allele specific, so just uh, targeting 
a narrower version of the KRAS spectrum that we spe- see in pancreas cancer. Are, are any specific to the uh, specific mutations? Like my aunt is has the Q61, so mm-hmm. a bit more rare, um, which is why we had noticed this particular trial. But as you mentioned, I've heard there's many more coming. So yes. I guess, h- how do you... Um, get assessed or figure out what the next step is in terms of um, what's appropriate given her profile? Is that just through meeting with uh, investigators or what's, what's the, how do you go about that process? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a, an important question and a, and a practical one, you know, for the sort of cutting edge in terms of what's happening in the field. I, I do think you know, big academic centers uh, are good places to to see and and consult. Yeah. I mean, it's not always obviously practical for for everybody, uh, but usually there we'll have a good sense of what's happening and where the field is headed and what trials are most relevant, if not you know immediately available. What might be sort of on the proximate horizon uh, right. for a given person. For Q sixty one H, that's about five percent of people with pancreas cancer. Yeah. And we we uh, anticipate that RMC6236 is going to cover uh, that spectrum yeah. and other agents too. So yeah. again, more more to more to come as we see this data sort of mature out and get presented, you know, at a at a major meeting in the hopefully not too distant future. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Welcome. Hi. Okay, Kathy, you have your hand up next. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're in a, you're in a purple light district, though. You're I know. I don't know why. Name. But anyway, uh, thank you, Dr. O'Brien. This is fascinating. I am a, a KRAS uh, 12F, and I have not heard of anyone with this. And I don't understand uh, how that fits into the picture. Would I be someone who could potentially be enrolled in a 6236 study uh, at some point? Um, I've been on chemo all this time, four years, doing fairly, I mean, fairly contained um, stage four. Um, And where would I uh, be able to locate these type of clinical trials? Are they? Yes. So thank you. You know, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. So right. So, mm-hmm. so thanks for the for the question, and uh, uh, maybe I'll just mm-hmm. uh, kind of broaden it, uh, so to to address the the first point first. Just what is uh, G twelve? So in pancreas cancer, for KRAS, we see three common versions of the gene altered: G twelve D, G twelve V, and G twelve R, and that's mm-hmm. about you know thirty five, thirty, and fifteen percent respectively. Q sixty one. H is the next most common, and then there's much rarer uh, versions, but uh, most of them fall at the G12 uh, position in F, uh, G, L, A, etc. cetera, uh, all the letters of the alphabet. And uh, again, we think that the, the current drug that we've talked about, and uh, not to focus exclusively on this, but just to, because it's the one furthest along and because there's public data available, we know that it has activity, you know, across all of these mutations. We'll need to learn whether some versions of the mutation are more susceptible, whether the degree of response is greater and perhaps more durable. We also need to know whether just narrowly Uh, targeting that version of the mutation for the more common ones is going to be a better choice versus Mm. a PANRAS inhibitor. It's never going to be scalable for the very rare versions to have a specific drug for that. Mm. Uh, But for the common ones, we will. And that's something that will, you know, again, have to be sort of teased out over the the next period of time. Uh, But we anticipate we'll have you know, insights in in the next year on on this. And I think for the second part of your question, uh, I think it circles back to the the other uh, lady who asked the the question that, you know, academic centers, you might want to uh, link in with some of the advocacy organizations that can Mm -hmm. do a clinical trial search uh, for you that will tailor it 
to specifics and help guide you geographically, mm -hmm. you know, as to what might be be practical. And mm -hmm. if if you don't have that, I can pass on a few resources to Brad to uh, circulate to those that might be interested. Thank you. Yeah, just on that score, we've used Massive Bio, which provides a mm -hmm. free pointer to clinical trials. And as well as we just had a session a couple of weeks ago with My Tomorrows, provides yep. a similar service. And, and I'm sure there are others as well, but uh, mm -hmm. those are a couple we know. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, Gita Peterson is up next. She's a, a researcher uh, with a company called Genomic Expression. Yeah, so um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Riley. Um, we <clears throat> were contemplating filing a, a grant application in, in a, um, pancreatic cancer, uh, partly motivated by <clears throat> our personal experience with a friend that we lost last year, very quickly, two months. And um, understanding the, the very top level of understanding that Pancreatic cancer is probably the most deadly cancer uh, out there, and it seemed to be uh, very hard to to treat. Um, so a couple of things that I want to ask you about, because I went to a number of conferences. At some point, one of the ideas were that uh, the reason for the lack of response to, to chemo was due to the pancreatic microbiome. And I don't know where that hit story went, if it's still something that um, is circulating or not need further validation. So that was question number one. Number two, um, is there any test, and I understand the, the problem with getting biopsies, um, but is there any test that can guide the first line of treatment beyond the germline test available. Um, and the, the last one is the, again, the understanding that I have gathered from going to these conferences is that the pancreas, pancreas is so dense. So one of the key problems is getting the drugs into the pancreas. And, and maybe the specific treatments to augment that is a separate issue beyond the effectiveness of the drug. So those are my three questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, uh, covered a lot of ground in those questions, so I'll, I'll do my best here. So starting with your first question on the microbiome, yeah, I think that this is a fascinating area, right, as, as we learn mm -hmm. how this might predict whom re may respond to, to treatment, who may respond to immunotherapy, and whom may even be more susceptible to get this disease in the first place. I truly think we're kind of uh, just at our infancy in terms of understanding uh, what this means in pancreas cancer, uh, and still a ways away from how we might utilize uh, that in terms of direct clinical practice, but uh, clearly a fascinating area of research. I, 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 Definitely not an expert in this area, but just kind of watch along and uh, learn uh, uh, and see, you know, how how this may impact in the future. So, so that um, I'll, I'll I'll just circle to the second uh, question, and I think it was sort of the theme of like maybe what models can we use to predict uh, maybe in the body or outside of the body uh, treatment sensitivity and or resistance, and and apply that in the clinic. And there, there are a number of ways of trying to do that. And one of the big challenges always is, you know, how replicative or representative rather is the model system of the very complex disease that we see in people. And, uh, you know, what we see there, can we apply that? And mm -hmm. there's a number of ways of trying to do that. And one of them is we take uh, a sample of uh, a tumor growing in a mouse, right, and do drug profiling uh, in the lab and see if we can apply that or using a 3D culture, uh, 2D culture models, uh, organoids, uh, uh, et cetera. Still not clear uh, whether they will truly inform how we approach it in the clinic. Part of the challenge is the timelines for getting the information for, for most uh, people. 
And part of the challenges were missing, for example, that whole stroma, that was your third question, and how that may or may not impact response to therapeutics. Um, we're often, for some of these models, missing uh, the critical component of the immune system and how that may impact or not impact. So they do give us, you know, give us some, some insights. And there are a number of trials that are trying to see if we could use this information in real time to tailor clinical decision making. Uh, but I, I think we still have a lot of work to do in, in, in this. And there are, you know, yeah. a number of uh, profiling approaches using uh, formal and fixed tissue and looking at expression uh, and seeing if the expression of certain molecules might enrich for uh, mm -hmm. treatment opportunities. And that, of course, is a lot of what we're doing in terms of uh, clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, a, a lot happening in this space, and uh, but still uh, we need... We don't have a perfect model of this disease, even though we have some very good ones. So I just want to add um, information because there was a paper out. We talked about early detection before. It was a collaboration between uh, researchers in Denmark. Søren Brunach is actually somebody I know. And uh, Stanford, where they used um, EMR data. So blood numbers we talked about. Uh, some some of the early signals, diabetes, you know, pancreas is connected, um, but uh, they were able to identify patients 12 months prior to diagnosis using AI of existing EMR data. So yeah. you know, I think that that um, uh, some of these methods that you talked about is so low frequency that screening everybody is challenging, but I think with these new technologies, we might be able to narrow the field a little bit and um, hopefully there, find some stuff that can be more effective. Thank yeah, you. There's, there's no question about it. And okay. I, 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 I'll just give an example. Uh, and it's just one small example of how this might you know, impact is our colleagues at Northwell have, have looked at an AI tool, their general health system, Mm -hmm. looking for uh, people who had imaging, who came to the emergency room with abdominal pain or uh, and had a pancreas finding. So just not mm -hmm. pancreas cancer, but just a pancreas finding and using that marker to flag that individual and to kind of short circuit the system and mm -hmm. one, make mm -hmm. the awareness known and get that individual into the system to get it worked up. And even doing that, right, even just getting the diagnosis quicker and sooner and people linked in, uh, you can right there see that if you add up all of these incremental changes uh, in terms of access, et cetera, that that can, can make a difference. And lo lots of examples of, of um, using imaging uh, and AI tools as to how we might, again, impact the early detection. So yeah, I think we're again on the cusp mm. of something really, really interesting for this disease in terms of getting some lead time before yeah. the clinical presentation when sadly yeah. a lot of people are, are, are quite sick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Rick Davis, you're up next. Hi, Dr. Eileen. Um, privilege to talk to you in person. Um, the first, um, the first question I just wanted, I really wanted your thoughts. You haven't said a lot about the, the difference between uh, neuroendocrine and exocrine, and maybe you can, you can voice a few thoughts on that. The, the other issue that's on my mind, um, we're supporting a person who has, um, significant um her two um expression um and he's treated at a community clinic and after three years they finally figured out they should be focusing in on this hgr2 expression which just astonishes me um and i'd like to come back just for your thoughts on on their choice of treatment because i question it but that said, um, it, it seems to me this is a real problem for pancreatic cancer that we 
so many people are still treated in a community setting and the people in the community setting are, don't think the way you think. And, and, and I'm not sure how we address that. I mean, what, what, what do we do for all these people who, who can't get to the types of treatment you're talking about? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great, great questions. And uh, you're right, I probably should have set the scene a little better in that the discussion today was focused on adenocarcinoma, and, uh, but not in any way to take away from the neuroendocrine field. Uh, and just a kind of recap of the spectrum of, of pancreas malignancies that we see, adenocarcinoma is probably nine and a half out of 10 people, a smaller percentage will have neuroendocrine, which is uh, from the, uh, what we call the endocrine component of the of the pancreas. And then we'll rarely see things like asinar, occasionally we'll see metastasis in the pancreas from another malignancy, occasionally lymphoma in, in the pancreas and uh, smaller numbers of very rare, rare events. And uh, neuroendocrine cancer is a distinct and different malignancy and, and treated very differently, prognostically different and less, less targeted based approaches than perhaps uh, adenocarcinoma is increasingly uh, seen to have. I think your second uh, point is again, a very important one for the field. And, you know, having again been in this field for a while, it there's understandably right over the years been a lot of therapeutic nihilism about the approach to pancreas cancer and goes to the, you know, to even the basic things of somebody with a diagnosis of metastatic disease, uh, not necessarily having the opportunity to have a referral to an oncologist to discuss, you know, whether or not uh, treatment is indicated, not to mind what type of treatment and that that sort of point was being uh, decided in, in advance of that. And, and, and that happens more, more than, than we think even even today and um so just yeah uh i think it's education it's you know outreach it's understanding that the world is changing and hopefully changing very meaningfully uh, for adenocarcinoma of the pancreas and that again, ideally, uh, that there is access to you know a comprehensive cancer center, and it's not just about the the therapeutics, right? It's an integrated approach uh, uh, you know, for the challenges with bile duct obstruction or blockage of the duodenum. You know, being able to manage that uh, successfully, treating blood clots, managing pain, optimizing nutrition getting in pancreatic enzymes, right? All of the important things that we know can impact quality of life, length of life, and ability to give mm -hmm. treatments. And it's, uh, you know, I, I hope we'll see more of this in, in terms of, you know, bigger community-based expertise. And I think it's not for want of interest. It's just, uh, it needs dedicated resources and time and people. Yeah. I mean, when we, when we have the opportunity to work with the, the drug companies in other areas, um, we talk a lot to them about better education to the community practices um, for all different types of new drugs and cancers. The, the, the specific issue that, that, that concerned us for this particular patient was that the community practice um, happened to be running a taper arm of uh, a TISO plus FESCO. And um, we felt, speaking to our own um, advisory board e experts, that an hair to which has just been approved, would be a much which would be a much better option. Um, but they they just railroaded this poor guy into their arm, which again gives me a lot of concern about. Um, academic conflict of interest as well, which we do see. I, I'm sorry to have to say it, but we do we do see it. And, um, you know, I don't know how he's going to do. He he immediately responded badly to the Atizo with rashes and goodness knows what. But um, I, I just I just wonder, I mean, you, you've got a new drug like Enherta, which has just been approved. Um, why you don't use it? Why you put them into something that's that's ages old and we don't even know if that combination is going to work? I mean, if a person came into you with a, with with high HER2 expression, what what would you do with them? 
Yeah, so sp speaking generally here, firstly, it's uncommon in pancreas cancer just to, you know, to make the point and uh, RAS-driven uh, malignancies, it's they're usually inverse. Uh, and yeah, he so, had a RAS, he had a KRAS mutation too. Yeah, so it, it makes, again, not knowing anything about the specific profile here, but it, it always makes me wonder when somebody has a RAS mutation, how meaningful the HER2 part of the activation is. And it, there's you know diff different ways of of looking at that via immunistic chemistry, obviously looking at the copy number and looking at it from the next generation sequencing perspective. Um, I think one would want to be convinced that that truly was the actionable part of the genomic alterations that this mm. individual has to say that going down that route is, is a good one. And again, not to take away from trastuzumab, deruxtecan, uh, but data were presented at ASCO this year. And even in the small subset of people with pancreas cancer did have high expression. Signal was more modest than anyone would really? wish. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's not straightforward is what I would say. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, maybe there's kind of more to the story here that's guiding uh, in the background. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um... <clears throat> Dr. O'Reilly, we're uh, on, on, up on the hour. We have a few more questions, as you can see. Um, we can wrap here, or if you have a few more minutes, we can keep going. Great. I'm good till about uh, one ten, if that works okay. for everyone. As, if time for a few more questions, then. Um, also, I've noticed there have been some things in the chat um, from uh, Ellen Miller, if, if uh, we can get to those. Um, Jill, you're up next. Can you hear me? Am I off mute? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I just to follow up to my previous question, I apologize. Um, for the um either the phase three or the phase uh one that's ongoing for the RMC 6236, um, for the exclusion criteria, can they be on more than one type of chemotherapy already, or has it does it have to be a first attempt? And can they have had any adjunctive therapy within that? Uh, so for the phase three that's happening uh, in the second line setting, comparing RMC6236 to chemotherapy, uh, right now the the way it, it's planned is just one line of prior one. chemotherapy and no okay. prior RAS targeting approach. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then for the phase ones that are still open, if they are, is it again uh -huh. just one line? No. So t it all depends on how the study is written, but typically okay. for phase ones, they're in general a lot less restrictive on in terms of the extent of prior treatments. Okay. Having said that, there are some phase ones which are looking at chemotherapy-based combinations, and uh, there may be, uh, again, more limited right. uh, restrictions okay. in terms of the amount of treatment in that setting. Okay, perfect. And the last question I had was just, if you were a patient considering your second line options, what would you think of to try to decide between a, a RAS-based treatment versus an immunotherapy route? What would be sort of your top things that you'd consider for that patient? I think understanding the genetic profile of the, you know, particular individual's tumor would be important. And okay. also understanding what uh, immune therapy based approaches it is a wide field and and some things yeah. are you know <laughs> relatively far along in development and others are uh, very early and and we right. really don't know yet right for immune checkpoint blockade you know for the uh, pembrolizumab nivolumab etc yeah. those drugs on their own have you know value in about 1% of people with pancreas cancer where there's mismatch right repair deficiency or a lot of mutations. So it's not a yeah. frequent uh, combination, not to say that there, you know, isn't merit for combinations with immune checkpoint blockade. And, mm -hmm. and that I think would be what you would have to, to look at. I, I might suggest again, not knowing the, the specific person, but I do think for most people with this disease, the high priority is going to be a RAS therapeutic approach when there's okay. a known RAS mutation presence. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. Up next is Alan Morris. Alan is a pathologist. You can see him sort of in his office. Usually he has his microscope, you know, just around the corner. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and Alan's been asking a, a flurry of questions in the chat. So Alan, I hope you can choose one or two that are, are short and sweet. 
Hi, Dr. O'Reilly. Um, this is actually the, uh, one of the, I, I haven't heard a pancreatic uh, cancer talk and I can't remember how long. Um, I, th I think progress has been significantly made. Um, uh, I have 12 questions in the chat box. I'm not going to read them. I'm just hoping maybe you can take some time out of your incredibly busy schedule to answer uh, my 11 other questions. I'll just limit my question to one, and that's um, because I got an answer in the chat. Um, and that is, does germline BRAC mutation or other homologous repair mutations have greater clinical impact than somatic? In other words, to emphasize, I'm looking at, is, is there a difference between a germline mutation and somatic mutation as far as clinical response? Thank you very much. That's a great question, and it's one that we've been looking at and others in the field for a while. What we think matters is whether there's loss of the second version of the gene in in in, in either in the blood or in the tumor, that that uh, this uh, LOH mm -hmm. or loss of heterozygosity is probably what predicts for benefit. So it's biallelic. So, for example, in about eight out of 10 people with pancreas cancer who have a BRCA mutation, we know that the uh, tumor is driven by the BRCA. But it means about you know two out of 10, it's not driven by the BRCA and BRCA targeting approaches probably don't have the same value for that person. And still a lot of ways as to how best to understand that because it's not as straightforward as it might seem in terms of knowing it, but biallelic mutations, whether somatic or germline or somatic and germline is probably the key thing that predicts for uh, the value of the therapy. Th thank you. Welcome. I'll look at the other, other 11 too. <laughs> uh, Francesca. Yes, Dr. O'Reilly, I'm sorry. I will try. Yeah, thank you. I will try to be quick. Uh, so my question is more about uh, another part of the diagnostic tool. So since I was a postdoc in the lab and now a Boston gene, um, there is, as you said, it's so difficult to get tissue sometimes and also liquid biopsy can be there. Sh maybe there is not enough material. So something that is in our efforts uh, at Boston gene, but also I was working actively in the lab is to look at the PBMCs, so do immunoprofiling uh, from the blood uh, for patients uh, to kind of inform and predict outcomes in, in the immunotherapy, which I totally understand is not the elective if there is a KRAS mutation, but maybe in the future when those KRAS will be also first line and maybe we'll think about a combo with immunotherapy, um, those kind of diagnostic might be also helpful. So I just wanted to have your opinion on that. Um, and yeah, what is your feeling uh, also about this kind of diagnostic? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really do think that there is a subset of, of uh, people with pancreas cancer where their genomic profile doesn't suggest that they're likely to benefit from immune therapy, but do. Um, but we need the tools to identify who these individuals are. And we have, you know, some hints in the kind of uh, retrospective setting when we, for example, collect samples as part of clinical trials and profile them and try to match that with response to resistance. And, and there are some hints, some signatures uh, that that may suggest that this is a group of people that are more likely to benefit from an immune therapeutic approach. And maybe, you know, I'm naive here, but I, I do think that we're going to see uh, more focus on immune therapies. We know from RAS therapeutics that the immune environment is really important and how those agents work, right? And that's true for chemotherapy, I'm sure of it is. It's just we haven't really focused on that and, and, and learned. So yeah, I, I, I definitely think this is going to be important. Not, not, not there today or tomorrow, but Part of, part of the future, I hope, uh, for this disease. Thank you. Yeah, yeah work in progress. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, we could, uh, I think we could spend more time, a lot more time, uh, going through the questions in the chat, whatever. But since we're past the hour and out of respect for everyone's time, I think I'll stop the recording here. And